There, yeah, we're recording now. Yeah, and if it just uh, saves to your computer, that works. Okay. All right. You can always send this out to people, so. Just gonna see if I can get. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Perfect. All right. Well, let's get started here. See my screen okay? All right. Okay. Um, everybody, uh, if you guys, so if anybody's got questions during the live portion of this presentation, please uh, unmute yourself, ask questions. Um, the whole goal of this is to not be the one just talking, but to teach everyone and just communicate um, a little bit about heart health and understanding, you know, the different concepts of heart health and what the goal of today's presentation is to take you into looking at different components of what we see on the news and, and what we hear in the community about heart disease and is it this that causes it is that and, and what is what are some new numbers perhaps that you haven't heard of that um, we're starting to, to look at? Because for the last 30 years, we've been looking at the same blood numbers. We've been looking at the same cholesterol and the same sugar numbers and the same, same, same. And, and we're really not seeing a big shift. And I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit on this, but we're not seeing a big shift in heart disease, diabetes, cancer, our three main diseases and killers in the United States we're not seeing those numbers go down. And in fact, we're seeing them go up. It's estimated that in the next five years that 74.9% of the population will be considered overweight with over 50% of that population being considered obese, which is a BMI above 30. So we are headed down a slippery slope, us Americans. Um, and unless we learn to draw a line in the sand in our own health and our own choices, um, we're just gonna be another stat. We're gonna be another number. Um, uh, and we really got to start to look at this as a way of preventing this from happening, not waiting till it happens and then decide to make a shift in life. So um, to get started a little bit, those of you that don't know me, I'm Dr. Justin. I'm uh, one of the chiropractors uh, and owner at Woodbury Spine and Wellness Center. I'm also a health and wellness expert. We've been running health and wellness components of, of different pieces of PT, chiropractic, nutrition, um, as well as physical or not physical therapy, uh, personal training in our office for the last nine years. So I've looked at a lot of blood work over the years and a lot of different types as we typically add genetic pieces and different components into understanding people's blood work. Um, and then also some of the numbers we're gonna talk about today. So um, let's get started. Um, maybe. I'm on. There we go. Okay. So go over a little bit of stats in the U.S. And I already mentioned a little bit with obesity rates and, and um, as well as uh, overweight and, and just where the United States is headed. But here's the reality of just heart disease in general. Um, heart disease is, in, according to the American Heart Association, 75 million Americans suffer from heart disease. Uh, 20 million Americans have diabetes, 47 million Americans have been diagnosed with prediabetes, which is where your, where your sugar numbers are exceeding or close to exceeding the higher rates as well as hemoglobin A1C. And so for those who don't understand hemoglobin A1C, um, we're looking at what is the blood sugar done over the last three months, okay? Um, also looking at insulin. What is insulin doing? Is insulin slowly creeping up? Um, as well, which is common and not usually tested, but insulin can be a precursor to understanding your diabetes if you're pre-diabetic, because if insulin is supposed to be less than eight and we're at 20, but our hemoglobin A1C is staying normal and our overall blood sugar is staying normal, the reality is, is that our bodies happen to produce two to three times more insulin to get that number to be normal. And to me, that's just not a good thing. That tells me that your pancreas is overworking to try to get a result of keeping your numbers normal. And guess what's gonna to happen to the pancreas over time? 
it's going to get tired. And when that happens, then those other numbers start to go up and now you'd be considered diabetic. And the reality is, I believe you were moving into that pre-diabetic long before that and we could have made corrections prior to that. So it's really understanding your numbers when you look at this. The crazy thing is that the cause of all the conditions above are thought to be elevated by cholesterol, right? And cholesterol gets a bad rap and we're gonna talk about that. But the CDC of the Center for Disease and control said the leading cause in the United States in the years 2015 until 2019, and even in 2020, is heart disease. Um, and one quarter of all Americans take some sort of a statin to, to then reduce the number of cholesterol in their bloodstream, as well as going on some sort of a low fat um, diet to also lower the cholesterol disease. But as we're doing that, as statin is the number one prescribed drug in the United States, and we continue to give people statins and we continue to reduce fat in diets. What do you guys think is happening to heart disease in the United States? I just told you it continues to go up. So common sense would tell us that if we're doing all the right things by giving statins, by changing people's lifestyles through low fat diets, that if we were doing the right things, that heart disease should start to come down. Yes or yes. And the reality is, is that we're just not seeing those numbers. And in fact, every single year in the last 10 years, heart disease deaths have gone up as well as the rate of heart disease in the United States has gone up. So again, we got to look at how can we draw, draw a line in the sand. Where do we get this idea that cholesterol is bad for us? Well, in 1953 is where it all started with this gentleman right here. Dr. Keyes had a PhD and he developed this lipid hypothesis where he said, you know what? If we have elevated levels of saturated fat in our diet, it is going to then level increase the levels of cholesterol in our diet. And therefore we're gonna get heart disease. So the cause of heart disease has to be saturated fats. It has to be fats in our diet. And we need to lower that, lower the cholesterol. And if we do that, we will then save the world and rid the world of known heart disease. What is cholesterol? Where does it come from? A lot of us understand that when we get high cholesterol, we should stop eating red what? Beef, right? I mean, we see that a lot where people are supposed to start to eat less red beef. And that's because red beef, chicken, eggs, beef liver, which I do not recommend eating unless you really like liver. Personally, not a fan. Um, whole milk, you know, skim milk, all of these are the most common places we find cholesterol or we find fat. And the reality is, is if you look at the definition, it's this waxy substance that's in every human cell of the body. So if we aren't we're not supposed to eat them, but yet we have it in every cell of the human body. We have trillions of cells and they all contain some sort of cholesterol. And in fact, our liver actually produces cholesterol because we need cholesterol to create, you know, certain hormones such as, you know, progesterone, testosterone, and estrogen. We also use it to break down vitamin D and other components of our body. So the reality is, is that although cholesterol is get, gets a bad rap as being bad, our body needs it. it. It cannot travel without it. So cholesterol in the form of in the body, the human body, it travels in particles called lipoproteins, which are known as HDLs and LDLs. HDL, or known as the happy cholesterol or the good cholesterol, so it kind of makes it easy of understanding is, is that it, it gets that rap of saying, well, this is the good cholesterol. Well, then the bad or the LDL, so we call that the loser cholesterol, helps you make, remember it, it's the bad stuff. And so if HDLs in the old school said if HDL levels could rise up and possibly above 60 milligrams per deciliter in our blood, this would help us prevent heart disease. And if we maintained a healthy weight, physical activity, and we did diet that includes healthy fats like olive oils and not those other fats like eggs and beef, and, and we eliminate those saturated fatty acids from our diet, well, then we're gonna be good. And the reality is, is we just didn't, again, in the early 1990s and, and early 2000s, we just didn't see the number of heart disease going down as we adopted these theories really strong. And in 2011, the National Institute of Health found that raising HDL really didn't have that much improvement on heart attacks. It really didn't make that big a difference. And that although higher HDL levels are desirable, it's the type of HDL. So what we're learning is, is that there's certain types of HDL or happy cholesterol that's better at 
cleaning up the bad stuff. So think of the HDL, these big, huge dump trucks going around our system and around our bloodstream, and it's picking up all the bad fats that are sticking, those LDL, those loser cholesterol. And so understanding that HDL2 type is the most prote protected type, meaning it's going to be the best cleanup type. And then HDL3s are inflammatory HDL, so that can cause inflammation in the body. So you really have to focus on the type of HDL and understanding the different types or components of HDL, as well as LDL. So although this is the bad cholesterol and it does get a bad rep, we still need it in our bloodstream, right? We still need it as part of our overall system. And so the current standards say that if we have less than 100 milligrams per deciliter of cholesterol in our body, well, we would see a risk or the risk of heart disease go down. And the reality, again, that's just not showing it because no matter how much we control the number of LDL in the bloodstream, the results of heart disease remain the same. And so it's understanding the type of LDL cholesterol. So again, there's three different types. There's LDL-A, which is more buoyant. It's a fluffy molecule that goes around and it really has no harm. But it's the LDL-B, the smaller, harder, more dense of molecules that produce atherosclerosis, which is inflammation of the arteries. So think of it like this. If I have a fistful of sand and I have a fistful of rocks, the sand is the LDL-B. The rocks is the LDL-A. If I was to chuck the rocks on the carpet that I'm on right now or your carpet at home, we can pick up the rocks and pebbles really easily. Those are the kinds we want in our system because then that happy HDL dump truck can go around and pick that stuff up and get rid of it out of the system. But if I took the same LDL, but now use the sand, the hard, dense, small particles, and I spread those across the carpet, they're going to seep in, right? And so if there's any inflammation in the arteries and it creates cracks, that the sand can get into those cracks and start to create clotting and problems within our cardiovascular system, which creates atherosclerosis and then leads to, you got it, heart disease. So it's understanding the different types of LDL that becomes more important than just getting rid of all the LDL. The other one is an inherited LDL, which is, or LDL, which is LP little a. And this is bad if you, if you have a lot of this in your system and you produce a lot of this, again, it's, it's a hereditary thing. So some people will produce more as a hereditary component. And these are extremely small and can create blood clotting and other components of that atherosclerosis process. Okay, so how do we measure this? Well, the reality is, is we the standard we've been we've been measuring for years, and that's the HDL and the LDL. But what we know about just the standard, if you take those standard numbers, it's really the ratios that matter the most. So with the LDL and the HDL, you see at the bottom of the screen, we want to be a three to one ratio, meaning we don't want more than three times LDL over HDL. The other number that we look a lot at with these traditional numbers is the ratio of HDL to triglycerides. And so even though we're not going to dive deep into triglycerides today, triglycerides are the super sticky fats. They come from a lot of processed foods. So when you look at a label and you see anything that says hydrogenated, processed fats, any label that has like 15 different ingredients on it, walk away from it. Stick to one ingredient's foods. I'm jumping ahead of myself, but one ingredient food is always the way to do it. So if we were to go and get an apple from an apple tree and we wanted to look at the label, turns out, first of all, God didn't give it a label because it only has one ingredient and that's an apple, right? Those are the types of foods we really want to eat and focus on. But with the triglycerides to HDL ratio is that if we have a certain number, again, more triglycerides than HDLs, or more HDLs and triglycerides in our bloodstream, then ultimately we want to keep that at like a two to one ratio. And that means that the HDL is able to clean up and pick up all this junk that we have in our bodies and our bloodstream to just be really simple. So understanding those, but then you can go deeper and we can test the levels of LDL A and LDL B and understanding what levels you have in your system. So you could have high cholesterol LDL, but you could have high of the good stuff and not necessarily the bad stuff. But again, are you a high absorber or a high producer, right? Because we talked about before that LDL and cholesterol is produced in the liver. So some people are gonna produce a lot of cholesterol so they don't need to eat a lot of it. Does that make sense? Where other people aren't gonna produce as much so they need to eat more to get their numbers up. So me personally, I am both a high producer and a high absorber. So if I both produce and absorb high fats, I need to eat a diet 
that is focused on not having as many bad LDL in there because that will create a lot of high cholesterol, which is why both my grandfathers passed away from heart disease and heart attacks. So there is the genetic component of understanding your blood. Now, I could have gotten my other grandparents' uh, genetics, but I was not blessed with those. So it's understanding what you have and where you come from to really make it important. So old school of eating said, hey, let's eat less than 300 milligrams of cholesterol a day, eat less than 10% of our calories as saturated fats. What we're learning again now, you know, based on this Farmington heart study is that it's not, not, not in that one of the four trials showed the slightest evidence that a man who consumed more cholesterol in a diet did not have any higher blood cholesterol than those consume less. Because again, it's about absorption and it's about production. You have to understand that before you look at what your dietary cholesterol and your blood cholesterol is. So are you a producer or an absorber? And once you know that, then it opens a whole new area of understanding the type of food and things that you need to eat. So at this point, what we've learned is that in the early 90s and 2000s, we did what? We removed what from all the food? You saw a whole bunch of stuff that said fat, free, right? Everything went fat free. If you don't remember it, there was all kinds of foods. And they said hundred calories we removed all the fat, but Hey, we went ahead and added aspartame and all these other byproducts to it to make it taste good, but it doesn't have any fat. And so therefore your heart disease is going to go up or going to go down. Your risk is going to go down. And the reality is, is we continue to see it go up. So we had to, we had to look at other ways. And in, in Western medicine, we really haven't, we still are seeking out the idea that cholesterol is causing heart disease and giving out drugs to lower cholesterol, and we're still seeing heart disease go up. So we have to make a shift. And what we know now, based on all the evidence, if you read the research, is that it's not about saturated fatty acids. It's not about the meat and the cheese and the butter and the eggs. Those are actually really good for you because those don't show a risk in heart disease or heart attacks. There's no, there's no connection between that. In fact, we see more of a rise in the good cholesterol by eating these fats and these, these meats and cheeses and butters and eggs because it's the right kind of butter and it's the right kind of eggs that will increase HDL, right? So grass-fed, free-range, things like that because when animals eat grass, they get omega-3 fatty acids into their meat and therefore when you eat their meat, you're getting components of that healthy fats, those HDLs. So it's really going to flip your minds and thinking all this time I've been told to eat less meat. And the reality is, is if we're eating good meats, it's actually going to be okay for you on the cholesterol side and that the saturated fatty acids tend to not show a pattern when it comes to heart disease because saturated fatty acids produce those nice, fluffy, healthy LDLs. So what produces the bad LDLs? So why is, what, what's the cause, right? What causes inflammation in the body, right? Because that's what we need to know is, is diabetes, heart disease, and cancer are all inflammatory diseases in the body, meaning they create inflammation in the body that then creates a disease process through the cells that then causes whatever the problem is. And so if you look at an acute inflammation versus chronic, it's understanding that chronic inflammation does not have a symptom, right? If I sprain my ankle and it swells, that's acute inflammation. We can feel that. But chronic inflammation does not. People walk around with high C-reactive protein and other inflammatory markers in their bloodstream, and they do not feel it, right? Because it comes across as memory effects or diabetes, right? Typically, you don't feel diabetes until your blood sugar is in the six, seven, eight hundreds, and you have all these crazy symptoms, right? Obesity is a chronic inflammatory disease. Arthritis, cancer, neurological, influenza, pneumonia, chronic liver, kidney, heart disease, all of these are slow processes over time, because let's be honest, my two grandfathers that died of heart disease never once had a heart issue until they had the heart attack. Does that make sense to everybody? The first symptom that they experienced was death from a heart attack. And we all know someone or a relative or a family or someone who knows somebody that at the age of 30, 40, 50 died or passed away too early of a heart attack, similar to my grandfather's. And if I knew this information then that I know now, I could of course corrected them and help them get on a healthier path before they had the one symptom that killed them. So we can't wait for a symptom when it comes to inflammation because inflammation creates, creates oxidization in the body, which creates free radicals and free radicals float around our system from toxins, whether it's the medications, the air we drink, air we breathe in, 
the air through you know, cigarette smoking or other things that we're taking that are unhealthy, and it changes the DNA and the cells in our body and creates destruction through stress and different components. And so unless we're taking some sort of a supplement or vitamin to decrease that, we ultimately create more inflammation in the arterial walls, which then makes it easier and easier for heart disease to start to happen. And we know now that the number one cause of heart disease in the United States is actually sugar. Because when we eat carbohydrates and we eat sugar, the body converts that into fat known as cholesterol and has a couple different options. So let's go through what sugar is. You know, when we look at hormones and the control of the metabolic event that goes on, right? We talked about hormones that we need cholesterol to produce hormones, right? So if we're taking a drug that's lower in our cholesterol in our body, do you think we could have some problem with hormones? Do you think right now in the United States, we have men with less or more testosterone, women that are having more issues with estrogen or less issues? And the reality is, is we're seeing more and more of it. And it's because we're eliminating the good healthy fats from our system. And so like we talked about before, insulin maintains the sugar levels in our bloodstream, right? And so when we go in an anabolic process where the insulin gets too high, guess what we have to do with that sugar is we have to start to store it, right? Because we cannot use it. So the insulin almost becomes like a fat fertilizer in this component where as insulin goes up, it's because the sugar went up in our bloodstream and the insulin is then going to spread the sugar out and produce fat and start to store it. And we start to store it in the lockdown areas in our waist and around our organs where it's hard to lose. And then we have that weight stuck or that fat cell stuck in there and they start to suffocate our organs and again, create that inflammatory process. Okay. As we're converting this sugar into fat, it becomes really super, super sticky. And you'll see the word glycation at the bottom. And this is where the sugar molecules start to become sticky by to the protein molecules that are inside of our vessel walls. And this is how sugar actually creates the problem of sticky artery disease that then creates heart attack, heart attacks for people all over the world. So let's talk about the number way, number one way we try to eliminate cholesterol. We've touched base on this and it's a statin, right? Statin or is the, this Lipitor 10 is the number one prescribed medication in the United States by far, right? Again, number one prescribed medication in the United States. Shouldn't we see heart disease going down? I think we should. If it actually worked, we'd be able to see it going down. And the reality is, is that it's not working. So we're cutting off cholesterol production in the body, right? So the statin shuts it down, shuts the liver production of cholesterol in the body. We can still absorb it, which is why we say a low cholesterol diet in this case to then eliminate cholesterol altogether. And then you, you start to you start to basically starve the system, right? And a, the easiest way to look at it is this way. If it goes, it's the same as stopping the growth of a branch at the top of the tree by starving the roots at the trunk. The side effect of starving the roots is that the rest of the tree will die. What is our roots? It's this thing right up here. Our brain is made of 25% of cholesterol. So if we stop the production of cholesterol in our body, and therefore this brain cells no longer get cholesterol as food, do you think we're going to get a little bit of brain fog? Do you think we might have some memory issues? Do you think we might get fatigue or different components of that? Right? So we need cholesterol in our body. And when we take a statin, it shuts that down. Yes, it eliminates the cholesterol of the body, but we know based on numbers that heart disease still goes up. And so in Iowa, they did a study that showed the cholesterol increased protein function by five fold, meaning the proteins start to have issues. So that's why people that will have take a statin will also struggle with right here, muscle pain, because your body needs CoQ10, right? So if you look at what CoQ10 is, is that it's a it's a coenzyme that the body uses to, met to metabolize proteins and therefore gets a good muscle production. And so when we don't have CoQ10 because statins stop that absorption, we see muscle pain, weakness in the legs, loss of energy as a side effect to statins. And guess where CoQ10 is found? It's found in every human cell of the body, right? It's used in a metabolic pathways in every cell, meaning the heart contains the greatest amount or concentration of CoQ10. So if you're taking a statin and you're, and I, again, I'm not going to tell you to stop taking a statin. That has to be a question you ask your medical doctor. But if I were your son or if I was your, 
you know, parent or brother or sister, I would tell you to have that conversation because if you're taking a statin, odds are good your CoQ10 is down, which is going to affect the overall health of your entire body because the cells are the foundation of our body and our health. So having that conversation with your doctor becomes really important. The struggle I find with most medical doctors I work with is that because there's so many medications and it's, this is not their fault and this is not a, a place for me to, to bash medical doctors because they do amazing things. You know, I once heard it described like this, if your house was burning down, would you call the carpenters or the fire department? Well, you're gonna call the fire department. They're gonna come in with their axes, their hose, their water. They're gonna destroy your home, but they're gonna get it to stop burning as fast as it can. And once it stops burning, are you gonna call them back to fix it? Or are you gonna call the carpenter back to fix your home? You're gonna call the carpenter and he's gonna come with his hammers and his tools and his saw, and he's gonna reconstruct, fix your home, and then help you maintain it from that point so you don't get another fire. That's the difference between a medical doctor and a wellness doctor like myself is that medical model is good at, at acute situations. If you're having a heart attack, go to the hospital. You know, if you're having some sort of event, go to the hospital. But the reality is if you're trying to prevent a heart attack from happening, taking a medical piece that is an emergency-based thing, a lot of times is going to help you. It may create a short-term band-aid that then allows you to make changes in your lifestyle, make changes in what you're doing so that you can be healthier. And that's what it should be. It should be something you're on the rest of your life. It should be something that you take until you start to get healthy. And you need to have that conversation with your medical doctor on changing lifestyles so that you can have you know, less drugs in your life, not more. And you need to take supplements that will give you heart health like CoQ10, right? We talked about how important that is. Magnesium, which helps relax the arterial walls and reduces high blood pressure, right? Because we don't want them, we don't want them dilated blood uh, vessels dilated. We want them opened up and nice and big and not small. Taking omega-3 fatty acids, which will help lower triglycerides. So lowering trans fats in your diet, lowering processed foods in your diet, going to one ingredient foods will help reduce your risk of heart disease and blood pressure as well. So those three supplements are really important for understanding heart health um, overall and, and lowering these pieces and then lower stress in your life, right? I mean, we all have stress, but it's how we manage it, right? It's how we manage the stress in our life that ultimately makes it so that we either have more of these free radicals in our system or less, right? So when we have three different types of stress, physical stress, which is the stress of, you know, sitting too much or not being, you know, exercising enough, you know, with COVID hitting like it has, you know, the reality is, is more people are sitting at home than ever did. And what I see is a lot of people who don't have great desks at home because at the office, they had good ergonomics and they had stand up desks and different things. But at home, they have their couch or they have, you know, their bed or different thing, places that just aren't as congruent for good posture. And so it creates a lot of physical stress. Then there's the emotional stress. You know, if you're like me, my kids are still waiting to get back in school. Hopefully this will be soon, but it creates a lot of emotional stress of having to be both a teacher, both a business owner, both a father. And it's a lot of emotional stress. And then there's the chemical stressors. And a lot of us you know, over the COVID time, you know, when we're stressed out, we, we eat something we shouldn't because it makes us feel better. Or we have an extra glass of wine because it makes us feel better. And those create a lot of chemical stressors in our system. So it's understanding how does stress affect it? Well, the reality is, is that when we are stressed out, our blood pressure or our heart rate goes up a little bit. We call this heart rate variability. And what we look at is what is the average heart rate over time? If zero is where you want to be, which is what's called parasympathetic, which is the brake pedal of the system. If that's where you want to live and be, that, that's zero. And then 100 is the fight or flight system. And this is the gas pedal. And that's when the system's fully on, a bear's chasing you, you're in your most stressful moment, you're sweating and you're all on the go. We want to exist somewhere in the middle where we can turn on the digestion, rest, reprocess, and health, and we can turn on that fight or flight system. But what I find is that most people are stressed out enough where they're 50% into fight or flight, into that all in mode all the time. So it's easy to go from 50 to 100. It's harder to go from zero to 100. And so we find ourselves stressed out and that stress then relates to higher heart rates and higher blood pressure. And then over time, those components feed into more and more. And that's how stress ultimately affects this system. 
and creates the risk of heart disease more and more. So you got to reduce stress. You got to find a way to be more like a caveman, right? Have less stress, have less, you know, ways to vent stress, you know, like, you know, prayer time in the morning or a quiet time in the morning. And then, you know, some sort of quiet time at night to balance out the day, you know, exercise is a great stress reliever. There is a ton of opportunity to exercise in this world and taking the advantage of exercise is really important. Eating good, healthy foods that will help reduce stress. One ingredient foods will help stress, reduce stress because when stress is up, our, our blood thickens, our arteries thicken, our heart rate goes up, our lungs and our muscles and everything have to work harder and harder and harder. And this puts us in an easy situation to increase heart disease. And if we're already eating unhealthy and we've been doing that for 10, 15, 20 years, a heart attack is just right around the corner. And that's why, you know, you hear people that were shoveling snow and they had a heart attack. And it's not that that moment of shoveling snow caused that heart attack. It's the accumulation of many events over time, but it was the small amount of stress of shoveling snow just one more time that put them over the edge and caused those symptoms that created the heart attack that ultimately took their lives. So if you know someone in your life that could use this information, please, please pass this on. So here's some take home stuff for you guys. I'm not gonna give you a ton of information without giving you some take home. So tests you should ask for from your doctor is particle sizes, right? What type of LDL do I have? Do I have a lot of A or B if I have that high cholesterol, right? What is my C-reactive protein, which is the number one marker for inflammation? You want that to be less than 0.8 milligrams per deciliter, okay? If it's up above three, it's really too high, okay? Fibrogen, the protein that determines how sticky or the stickiness of your blood, right? So Find out what, how much fibrogen you have in your body. It should be between 200 to 400 milligrams per deciliter. And then iron, you know, if high levels of iron are two times more likely to cause heart disease. So what is your iron? Do you have too low or too high? Typically people have too low, especially females, but with someone who has heart disease, will a lot of times have it way too high. So for women, it's less than 80 milligrams per liter. And for, uh, sorry, for women, yes. And then for men, it's 90 grams uh, per liter. Uh, less than that. So you need to eliminate these foods. You need to eliminate sugar. I had this conversation with a patient today. Sugar creates inflammation. Inflammation is heart disease, cancer, diabetes, most pain, most aches, joints, that type of stuff has inflammation. So you've got to cut out the pops and the soda, even the diet stuff, just because it says zero sugars or zero calories on it doesn't mean it doesn't have aspartame or sucralose or some other byproduct of sugar in there, which is again, causing you to produce more fat, more cholesterol, more heart disease, right? It, it's a marketing thing that tells you that diet soda is good for you. It is not good for you. Water is good for you. Get away from sugars, get away from fruit juices. Unfortunately, apple juice has just as much sugar in it as this can of soda. And as you can see, each one of these sodas, depending on the size, that's how many cubes of sugar each one has in it. Energy drinks typically have a lot. I have a lot of friends who like their Red Bull and their energy drinks. Again, a lot of sugar, a lot of caffeine in there. That will put you into fight or flight all by itself. So eliminating those things. Eliminating processed carbohydrates. So foods that come in packages. If it can live on a shelf for five years, it is not healthy for you. If I took a pound of hamburger and I thought it out and I set it right here, on this counter that I'm on and I left and then you and I came back tomorrow, are you gonna come back and wanna cook up that burger and eat a hamburger out of it? My guess is that most people don't want to because that meat's been sitting out for less than 12 hours on a table and nobody wants to touch it because it may smell funny, it's probably rotten. That's what good food does, it rots. If you don't eat it, it rots. A can of Coke, cereals, pastas, certain types of breads, they don't rot because they have a lot of preservatives in them, okay? So making sure that you eliminate those things from your diet, trans fat. So like we said before, anything that says hydrogenated, partially hydrogenated, which are gonna be cookies, donuts, cakes, all of those things that have a lot of margarine, a lot of those byproducts of butter in them are gonna have a lot of trans fats in them. And again, trans fats cause heart disease, okay? And then 
processed meats such as deli meats that have a lot of fats and sugars and things like that. And if you can eliminate some of those from your diet, but I'd rather be eating salami, sausage, hot dogs, and bacon than eating cereal, pastas, and uh, fruit juices. So um, just start to eliminate a few things. You don't have to eliminate them all, but you really got to start to look at your diet. And I know it's not sexy and it's not fun reducing things out of your diet. But if you want to live longer, it's the sacrifices we got to make. And then once you meet your health goals and you've gotten to the point where you want to, then you could have a cheat meal and have some pasta or bread for one meal and bring it back in. But then it's gone again for like another month or two. And, and playing that game of, of having good foods in your system is going to be really important. Um, another thing is, is eating the right foods, right? So eating more fish, eating more white meat, switching it up with reds and whites and different types. So wild salmon is going to have a lot of omega-3 fatty acids in it. Sea bass or grouper is going to be a deep sea fish that's really tasty and it's going to have a lot of, you know, good fats in it. Eating berries so that have an anti-inflammatory pro property with raspberries, blueberries, and strawberries, which are really good for you. But again, they have a lot of sugar in them. So you've got to watch how much you eat. You can eat some, but if you eat too much, then you're going to move into that too much sugar realm again, which then gets converted as fat. Grass-fed beef, like we talked about, eats grass, which has omega-3 fatty acids in it, which is then in the meat. So that's why eating better, leaner meats is going to be a big piece. More greasy, greasy lean, leafy green vegetables, sorry, been here since uh, 8.30 today are going to be really, really good for you as well with spinach and broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, all of those things are going to be good. So not everybody likes vegetables, but find some vegetables you like. What I can tell you is that 10 years ago, if you'd have told me I love Brussels sprouts, I told this, told you you were crazy because Brussels sprouts look, smell bad. Who wants to eat them? And what I can tell you today is that I love to eat Brussels sprouts when they're cooked right and they're cooked the way that they that you like them, anything can taste good. So give everything a chance. Just try cooking it different. Make it part of your home ritual where you're cooking things different at home to have different flavors in those components. Um, and then olive oil or coconut oil is a good oil to cook with. Stay away from the other oils to cook with. And using garlic, which helps with digestion and other components in your food um, is really good as well. So any questions from anybody? All right. So if you have questions, ask, um, but obviously, you know, with offer tonight, you know, obviously we do blood work in our office. Um, you know, the blood work we utilize and a lot of, and that's one concern too, you're going to find is a lot of the genetic blood type working that we do and the different tests we do aren't covered through insurance. They're typically covered as cash. We have a lot of patients that utilize insurance in our office, but typical blood work is covered, you know, usually once a year to, through your wellness component of your insurance. But the reality is, is this is blood work we're going to be taking that that is not typically covered because it's not a traditional wellness panel. Um, so to come in and do a wellness score and blood work in our office, you know, $249. Again, I just, the blood work company cha charges you. We draw the blood work, we send it to them. It takes about 12 days to get back. And then we sit down and we go through it. So that appointment would include both an initial appointment to get all the numbers, then a follow-up appointment to get the blood work done. And then a third appointment to sit down and go through everything. So you get all of my time, about two hours of my time, plus the blood work done at that 249. And then if you don't want to do one on the score, we just want to get your blood work done. It's 229. That will cover the blood work as well as me going through it. And again, we do that draw here at the office and then we send it out to our company called Vibrant America that does all the testing for us. So um, any questions? Uh, if you got a question, raise your hand. I mute yourself. Uh, I can unmute you as well. Uh, the big things the takeaways is just look at your diet, start to make some changes, realize that fat is not bad for you. Sure, too much of a good thing is still a bad thing, but fat too much fat is not bad for you. Sugar, a lot of sugar is bad for you. Um, and that's what creates a lot of the problems that we have in the world. Um, and that's why you're seeing more and more sugar-free stuff is because Again, they're going to market to whatever the trend is. Um, and I'm not a big fan of keto or this or that. Yes, some people should eat keto. Some people should uh, eat more uh, plant-based diets. It just depends on your genetics and your blood type um, and, and how you process foods. Um, but knowing that is half the battle. And then you can really focus on 
the foods as well as understanding how much muscle you have in your body because the number one sign of aging is loss of lean muscle. So if we're aging, I'm going to be able to tell just based on how much muscle you had a year ago. And if you've lost muscle over the last year, you are aging. And the faster you lose that, the faster you're aging, which ultimately means the closer we move towards death. So keeping muscle on our body while keeping fat off our body is the key to aging in a healthy state. Um, so we test how much muscle you have on your body in this wellness score. We test how much fat you have on your body in this wellness score. And we go through all these components of understanding the blood work. It's really amazing stuff. I promise you, you will have more information than you could ever imagine by going through the process of getting your wellness score and blood work done here at our office. So any questions? I can't find the ratio. I can hear you. <laughs> you can hear me? I, I can, yeah. Okay, great. Um, very good presentation. Great. And I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yes. I'm just curious, like some of these blood tests I am familiar with. Okay. Uh, some of them I can't pronounce. Um, but you said they were more to check like um, the fat in your body and insulin and various things. Can you uh, go into detail a little bit more about these specific tests? For sure. So like vitamin D, you understand that some, some uh, medical doctors will test that some won't again, typically not covered by uh, medical insurance lipid panel. You're going to be familiar with, with, which is your traditional cholesterol, HDL, LDL, um, with the LDL, we're going to do an LDL direct, which is going to look at how much of the cholesterol overall is actually just LDL. So it breaks it down. The apolipids are going to be those lipids, the LDL lipids that are the A's and the B's and the little A that we talked about. So those are going to be those pieces. Homocysteine, a C-reactive protein, and oxidative LDL, which is that oxidation component. Those are all inflammatory markers. So C-reactive protein is the most common, and a lot some medical doctors will test that. But homocysteine and oxidative LDL also give us inflammatory markers as well. So we'll test all three of those. Um, SDLDL is the density of the LDL. So again, that's that size component that we test. Glucose is obviously sugar. Hemoglobin A1C is what, how much sugar is attached to your blood molecules, what percentage. Um, and that tells us what sugar has done over the last three months of your life, um, which is a really common number in medicine for diabetics. They'll talk about a lot about their A1C number. Um, and then insulin is that precursor to how much, you know, your pancreas is producing insulin overall. Um, ALT, ALK, LST, creatinine, bun, all look at renal and kidney, or sorry, uh, liver and kidney function. Um, and then fatty acid panel is going to look at what type of fatty acids, omega-3, 6s, and 9s you have in your bloodstream, and specifically focusing on the 3 and the 6. MTHFR and APOE are both, both genetic tests as well, as well as that ALP little a, we're going to do those three genetic testing. Um, MTHFR it tells us your methylation ability. So we get two genes from each of our parents. And so we can have a double variant where we do not methylate certain folic acid B vitamins properly. And so people who have a high homocysteine or have high inflammation in their body, they're typically not metabolizing or uh, methylating certain vitamins or nutrients in their lives. So therefore they're more prone to have a negative effect of higher inflammation. So you can take products that are already methylated if you have that genetic variant. And then APOE looks at what type of apogenetics you have. So there's three types. There's an E2, 3, and a 4. And so if you're a 2, it means you're really good at processing uh, fats and not good at processing carbohydrates. If you're a 3, then you're blended. You can do both carbohydrates and fats really well. But if you're a 4, you're going to be really bad at fats, but really good at carbohydrates. So this person over here, if they eat a high fat-based diet, they're going to have high cholesterol. That's me. I typically, if I eat a really high fat diet without fruits and vegetables in there, I'm going to have high cholesterol. On the other side, the two person, if they eat a whole bunch of sugary stuff, they're going to be diabetic really, really easy. So it's understanding your food. And if you're somewhere in the middle, but you're not balanced in your diet, or you're eating one much, too much of one thing or the other, you're going to see those numbers come up as well. So we test all of those things 
in the panel. It's about a five page uh, panel for blood work. And then our wellness score includes functional movements. Uh, we typically, based on people's uh, problems, we'll look at posture, uh, we'll look at spine alignment, we'll look at the, the fat and the, the muscle in your body, we'll look at how hydrated the cells are in your body, um, as well as understanding some components of the nervous system. And then we put that in with all of the blood numbers and it gives us a score like a teacher from an A to an F on how healthy you are. And that's where the wellness score comes in. So we do all that for the 249. Long, long answer to your question, but did I answer it? Yeah. Great. Yeah. So, and then you could just do the blood work. Yeah. So if you didn't want to do the wellness score, you're obviously welcome to just come in and do the blood work. So you'd come in, you get your blood drawn and then 12 to 14 days later, we'd set up an appointment where you'd come back in and we would go through all your blood work numbers together. Gotcha. Okay. Well, does the wellness score, does that um, like sort of send you towards um, getting like adjustments? Sure. It could send you towards getting adjustments. It could send you towards doing PT, massage, nutrition, chiropractic, or I mean, uh, workouts. It just depends. I mean, in that process, we'll just look at goals and things like that, that you want to accomplish. And then what's, you know, your biggest health concerns, and then just try to find solutions for you, whatever that means uh, to you based on your goals. Yeah, because I am curious about the genetic component, because both my parents have had cardiac bypass surgery. Okay. And I tend to have higher cholesterol. So, um, you know, I think that's interesting. I never, I was never aware of the uh, LDL, the, what was it? The A and the B. Um, mm -hmm. The types of LDL. Yep. Yeah, I was never aware of that. So that's interesting. Um, so uh, um, it says here also that after tonight, the price goes up. <laughs> yeah, we just, we just. Yeah, we just lower the cost for the conversation of the talk. Um, so if you call in tomorrow, we'll honor it, obviously, okay. um, because we're doing the virtual thing now um, where the conversations used to be in person. And so the presentation was made like, hey, let's get you signed up tonight while you're here at the office type thing. But with the virtual, we're going this route. So if you call in tomorrow and talk to Allie, uh, you can call this number, the 651-731-0505. And just yeah. talk to Allie. Uh, she'll get you scheduled. Um, to come in and do the wellness score, the blood work and all that. Or you can give me your number and I can have her call you, whatever's easier for you. All right, well, I'm gonna talk with my husband here and yep. see if he would like to do it with me. But this, you said, doesn't isn't covered under insurance? No. No, no. yeah, just because it's different testing. So it's not a traditional yeah. testing. And you um, come- Go ahead. You come in fasting, obviously. Correct. Yep. You'll come in fasting. We typically will do it in the morning. Um, our typical times we do blood work is uh, before 7 a.m. on a Wednesday morning. Okay. All right. But I promise you it will be well worth your money um, to get all the information. If, if you just take it and do whatever you want, it's, it's, it'll be well worth it, I promise. Yeah, a lot of these tests I have had done recently, but... Some of the other yeah, ones. When you say recent, how soon? Uh, in the last six months. So it'd probably be good to still get them tested again. I like to say anything over six months has a lot of change in it just because we're either doing a lot of change towards the positive or we continue to go down the road of the negative that we've been on. So typically we'll see numbers change a lot in six months. So, and maybe yours don't typically over a six month time period, but it's always good to retest them. Okay. Yeah, and get other information. This is right. has, very helpful. Thank you. Good. I'm glad it was worth your time. So yeah, just give Allie a call or Allie a call tomorrow uh, here at the office six five one the seven three one zero five zero five, and she'll still honor this. And because okay. we're gonna post we're gonna post this recording on uh, Facebook, and so people that watch it will still be able to call in tomorrow uh, as well. So super. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. You bet. Great to meet you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Have a good night. You have a great night too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.